evening, everyone. Hi, Srinivas. Good evening. We are live. Good evening, everyone. As you all know, the new team of ARC has now been conducting various webinars. And this time, we are now coming out with a new set that is focused mainly on the subspeciality. As we all know, the majority of the subspecialities evolved in ophthalmology and 80 to 85 percent of which are being practiced by the general ophthalmology. So there is a need to revise the subspeciality topics with our comprehensive ophthalmic friends and fraternity. So we started the new series called a Saranj, which began in the month of Jack, and we first collaborated it with Sposi. And now we are having the second episode, and it's being collaborated with VRSI. I would like to thank the president of VRSI, Dr. Kim Sir, Secretary Dr. Manisha Madam, and Scientific Committee Chairman Dr. Mahesh Shanmugam Sir, and the entire GC of VRSI for giving us an opportunity to host with AIOS ARC. Along with that, we now introduce what is called as Saranj. So we gave, in this Saranj, we give a ready-made platter of the articles of the latest concept about the disease and its treatment modalities. So which general ophthalmologists can imbibe, it's something like a ready reckoner kind of thing. A general ophthalmologist can take it into practice. So without wasting much time, I would like to call upon the first speaker, Dr. Apurva. And before that, I would like to introduce our expert panel, Dr. Kim Sir, Dr. Anand Rajendran, a terrific uh, surgeon from Chennai Arvind Group of Hospitals, the uh, Secretary VRSI, Dr. Manisha Madam, and our ARC colleague from North, Dr. Tinku Bali. And we also have another dynamic uh, surgeon, Dr. Chaitra Chaidev from Bangalore, Dr. Manoj Katri from Chennai, and Dr. G. V. Ramakumar as well. Uh, and the chairpersons, uh, Dr. Prashant Bhavankwesar is traveling, so he'll be joining us very soon. And uh, thank Mahesh Shanmugam, sir, for chairing this session. And we have the young, robust team for the moderator. We have Dr. Sriram Simkurti and Dr. Simar Ranjan Singh. And I hope this will be uh, a really a great event for the general ophthalmologist as well as for the retina specialist with many takeaway messages and uh, which would be helpful for their practice. Thank you very much. Welcome once again, everyone. And uh, yeah, over to the moderators. Thank you so much, Dr. Srinivasa. And uh, I think we'll jump straight on to the first presentation by my good friend Apurva from M.M. Joshi Eye Institute, Hubli. Unexplained visual loss, retinal imaging to the rescue. Apurva, all yours, please. Thank you, ARC, VRSI. Thank you, moderators, for this opportunity. So my topic is unexplained visual symptoms, imaging <coughs> to the rescue. My first case is a 33-year-old woman, a di full diabetic. Her vision in the right eye was 6-9-N6 and the left eye was 6-18 parts and N8. On clinical examination, it looked like she had moderate to severe NPDR, but the FR was present although it was a little duller in the left eye. We can also notice a lot of cotton wool spots and here the cotton wool spots are at the macula as well. The OCT did not reveal too much, uh, but to a trained eye, you can see that the foveal contour is much widened in both the eyes, the left eye more than the right. And this was the OCTA because macular thinning and the clinical findings not explaining the vision, we always have to suspect ischemic maculopathy. If we look at the right eye OCTA in the superficial vascular complex, you can see some increased intercapillary spaces, which we call perifoveal intercapillary spaces increase. And this is also seen pr pretty well in the deep vascular complex. This is the left eye, which had a much uh, larger or a wider foveal contour. And we can see that the ischemia is much more impressively seen, both in the SVC as well as the DVC. You can see the very irregular foveal avascular zone with capillary dropouts as well as some telangiectatic vessels. 
I hear some beeping in between. I hope that's okay. And you're able to hear me uninterrupted. Yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Even the, the even new enter set that beeps. That's okay. Right. Uh, can okay. we mute All it? Right. If you can mute it, that would be good. Thank you. That's okay, sir. As long as it's fine, the transmission is fine. That's okay. So we all know that on FFA, we have irregular FAZs with capillary dropouts and non-perfusion at the macula. And FAZs are very well seen uh, to be acircular, having notches and irregular areas on FFA. So this explains the low vision in this patient and uh, has ischemic maculopathy has to always be suspected in such cases. And the uh, the the uh, important thing is that on OCT there may or may not be edema. This is case number two. I do not have a fundus picture. This is a sixty-nine year old lady, no systemic illnesses. Right eye, the vision was six eighteen and n twelve, and the left eye was completely normal. Now you can see that there is a very thin ERM, and there is some kinking of vessels that is seen in the superior paramacula. And this is the OCT. The OCT is not showing much of an ARM, although there is outer foveal loss and a small cystic space with hyperreflective foci. But the FFA was very well, uh, uh, remarkable in that, that it had a lot of collateral formation in the inferonasal macula, as well as these microaneurysms that were there. And this was, <clears throat> I'm sorry, this was suggestive of a small vessel occlusion or a tributary retinal vein occlusion. So tributary retinal vein occlusion, subtle ones can explain unexplained uh, visual loss. Uh, if if there is no clinical signs, an FFA or an OCTA can be very contributory in making the diagnosis of small retinal vein occlusions. Coming to case number three, this is a 25-year-old man who complained of diminished vision since childhood and both eye vision was low at 624 and N8. When we looked at the OCT, the OCT showed very subtle changes in outer retinal fuzziness as well as some cavitary changes in the outer retina. And the autofluorescence was uh, very uh, remarkable in that, that there was a holder opsin ring with almost like a bullseye pattern in both the macula. A diagnosis of cone dystrophy was made on this patient uh, on doing a full field ERG as well. So autofluorescence can be most contributory in such cases where the clinical examination was almost completely normal with sharp FR. The OCT had very subtle changes, but the AF had remarkable changes because of retinal thinning showing hyper AF and this bullseye pattern almost and this holder Robson ring showing the junction between normal and abnormal uh, macula. So case four is of a 47 year old woman the right eye was completely normal. She presented at 4 a.m. in the morning with sudden visual loss in the left eye. Considering that there was a cherry red spot and blanching at the posterior pole and some segmental blanching in the superior uh, parapapillary area as well, a uh, diagnosis of uh, probable central retinal artery occlusion was made. And this is the image at 11 a.m. where this blanching has somewhat come down, but this blanching persists after an anterior uh, chamber paracentesis and two tablets of uh, acetazolamide stat given in the morning, in the AM hours, early AM hours. So the workup, this patient turned out to be non-diabetic, non-hypertensive. Homocysteine levels were raised. The CRP was pretty raised. Uh, D-dimer was also raised marginally. And a carotid Doppler study was normal. If we look at the OCT, it showed uh, uh, expected findings such as hyperreflective inner layers with hyporeflective outer retinal layers. Now, the FFA had some interesting findings. There was a definite arteriovenous delay, uh, filling delay in this segment, which showed the blanching, that is superior parapapillary vessel, also in this superotemporal arcade. The inferior vessels were filling normally. Now, when we look at this particular vessel, it has much more delayed filling. Now, if we look at the disc, there was some blooming of this particular vessel at the exit from the disc. And this was getting stained in the late frames with very subtle disc leakage. 
a presumed inflammatory arterial occlusion was uh, uh, i mean it was a presumed diagnosis of inflammatory arterial occlusion this patient was started on oral steroids since this patient had only pl vision uh, she regained maybe cf half meter at one week but she continues to have low vision in the left eye this is case number 5 a 34 year old man with vision in the right eye of 618 and n10 and he complained of diminished vision since 2 to 3 years there was no systemic illness he was a young male homocysteine was also normal considering we had a working diagnosis of a sudden tributary retinal vein occlusion like we saw in one of my earlier cases since there were so many hard exudates and macular edema clinically we made a diagnosis of maybe a subtle trvo and we checked the homocysteine which was normal everything else was negative there was a lot of macular edema and these spaces looked like they were chronic and we injected with an anti vegf but one month post injection there was neither improvement in the vision nor much improvement on the oct we did an ffa because we were uh, suspecting that our trvo diagnosis may be wrong and interestingly my slides are moving on their own sorry about that so interestingly this patient had uh, telangiectatic capillaries in this c shaped pattern in the temporal paramacular parafoveal area and the perifoveal area so these telangiectasias were seen very typically in the temporal region of the uh, macula and this uh, th th there were some telangiectatic uh, vessels in the periphery as well which is expected in cases of macular telangiectasia type 1 so young males with a unilateral macular edema and no systemic cause uh, some many times we make a diagnosis of a subtle trvo and we keep injecting but when we do an ffa or an oct angiography these cases turn out to be macular telangiectasia type 1 and uh, pharmacotherapy may not be very useful for these patients because these are after all developmental changes in the capillaries which cannot be really treated so this is case number 6 a 48 year old man with diminished vision since 2 years in both the eyes and there were these uh, sr this this uh, srf pocket was there uh, and these shaggy photo photoreceptors it was assumed to be shaggy photoreceptors with some deposits on the rpe in both the eyes now this was diagnosed as bilateral chronic csc and uh, compounded by the fact that there were some um, sort of uh, leakages or hyperfluorescence in both the eyes and this was diagnosed as a diffuse retinal pigment epitheliopathy again a working diagnosis of chronic csc was made and an mplt was tried and again this patient received four anti vegf injections uh, in each eye but a simple autofluorescence imaging revealed that this was intensely hyperautofluorescent this material that was deposited on the rp in both the eyes and an adult onset foveal macular dystrophy was diagnosed in this patient so these kind of deposits vitally formed deposits uh, can be diagnosed and should not be mistaken for uh, anything like a chronic csc or an active cnvm uh, because in these cases injections may not really help and these cases eventually develop out develop outer retinal atrophy as this is the natural progression of the disease this is my last case we have all seen sometimes children presenting with this florid kind of disc edema bilaterally and these are subjected to a lot of investigations uh, for papilledema such as cns imaging sometimes lumbar puncture opening csf pressure and so on but it is always worthwhile to get an autofluorescence to rule out causes of pseudo papilledema like in this case which actually revealed hyperautofluorescent deposits on both the discs suggestive of disc drusen this is one of our cases where a multicolor image showed a lot of greenish hue which is usually seen in disc edema and an af revealed that this was indeed the disc drusen which was variably buried explaining the uh, variable exposure of the drusen material so that was my last case imaging is an ancillary tool and it does not replace history taking and clinical examination 
appropriate imaging should be used oct ffa icga oct angiography autofluorescence reflectance imaging can all contribute in making a diagnosis and help in the management imaging can help help clinch most diagnosis but for everything else we can keep looking carefully read report and seek expert opinions so thank you so much thank you thank you so much apurva that there was was some really nice cases uh, if we can involve the panel now if i could ask dr kim uh, sir if you are here so i think we saw a lot of modalities of imaging over here in apurva's talk if this webinar is more targeted towards the general ophthalmologist so if there was a stand alone setup and if you were to say that yes this imaging modality you must have so would it be one or you do you need all the whole gamut of multimodal imaging to solve these mysteries here thank you samira and uh, apurva that's a beautiful collection of very subtle cases where the diagnosis is is uh, you know is in a dilemma i think that was a beautiful all the cases that you showed you. definitely puts people in a in a dilemma and uh, one important thing is that in all these cases one common investigation is the oct which is what i think is a must today just like a slit lamp for any ophthalmologist to have oct <clears throat> with autofluorescence definitely makes a huge difference i think uh, apurva showed quite a few cases and how the, they could be diagnosed based on simple oct and those are subtle signs that she elicited very well you know those if people can understand those and able to read that oct findings i'm sure uh, you know they'll be able to make a lot more diagnosis than what they are doing you don't need multiple devices today uh, i think the basic one definitely is the oct uh, with out of fluorescence if possible thank you thank you so much sir I could ask Dr. Anand Rajendra, and I think we saw a lot of structural imaging here. Uh, what's your take on functional imaging electrophysiology for solving these mysteries? I think she showed a case of cone rod dystrophy and uh, the same way for uh, adult onset vitelliform and differentiating it from BIS. So uh, how important do you feel is uh, electrophysiology or functional imaging in these cases? I think uh, it's important, but I think the first thing is uh, to have a good uh, clinical diagnosis. Clinical suspicion is the key. So once that is there, then I think the non-invasive structural imaging, like Dr. Kim said, the OCT, the autofluorescence, multi-imaging, uh, multimodal imaging around that is important. But if you're, if you're, for example, if you that particular case uh, with the adult vitelliform macular dystrophy, uh, in that case. I would say with OCT and AF for all uh, macular degenerations or uh, their uh, phenotypes, uh, that is important. That probably would have uh, snapped up the diagnosis straight away and probably uh, micropulse could have been avoided. But that said, I would put, you know, ERG slightly, the slightly on the back corner. Again, once you know that uh, uh, your clinical suspicion is taking you in a particular direction, then I think it's important to be able to pull the trigger and ask for that. Both those cases, the cone dystrophy case, as well as that uh, adult with lipom, uh, they will help. But nothing like your uh, clinical diagnosis plus the structural imaging. Also, if I may add, if the practitioner has OCT angiography, that's a big boon as we saw in that first patient where there was macular ischemia. Also, if I might, I might just uh, add a, you know, just a caveat to that other, the last case, where one finds uh, disc edema, when I mean, of course that was a child and it was fairly straightforward. Again, there the autofluorescence really uh, threw up the diagnosis. But again, disc edema sometimes, one thing uh, people often miss is uh, checking simple blood pressure. You know, very often even young patients come in. In fact, today I saw a patient, uh, a patient in their uh, late 20s come in and in the PP, again, side disc edema, mild blurring of vision, came in and BP was 180 slash 130. Something. So I'm just uh, putting that thought also. Sometimes a simple systemic investigation also uh, is important, which is sometimes missed. Right, right. Thank you so much, sir. If I could ask Dr. Manisha, I think what I liked about Apurva's talk was she used some of the simple terms like inner retinal hyperreflectivity rather than some of the fancy ways that we have started describing them now. 
So uh, do you feel that is more important, just picking up those signs and looking at where the problem lies in the retina, which layer it lies, rather than remembering all those fancy names and then kind of correlating it with the pathology? Absolutely, Simmer. I think it is more, I think the topmost thing would be a very thorough clinical examination. And based on your differential diagnosis that you have drawn from the clinical examination, you're going to be doing a tailor-made investigations of the patient. And when you say those subtle signs, I think it's extremely important to pick up those subtle signs. It doesn't matter whether you add any fancy term to those. I think these are just entertaining us with all fancy new terms. But I think it's important to pick up those subtle signs like she showed a branch retinal artery occlusion where she picked up that high reflective band in the middle retinal layers. Now, if you miss that, you probably will not be able to really make a diagnosis. So it's important to pick up those signs rather than really know what fancy terminology is attached to those findings. This last question before we move on to the next talk by doc to Dr. MPS, sir. So uh, FFA versus OCT NGO, sir, what is your take? What is the role of FFA now if you have an OCT NGO, especially for uh, macular disorders? Macular disorders like yeah, OCTA does give a lot more information as compared to an FFA because the FFA, the leakage of the dye blurs the, vas the uh, vascular network. But the issue is like there are certain situations where the FFA is uh, still of paramount importance. For instance, a myopic CNVM, I would think that like an FFA is able to pick it up much better than as compared to a octa because like it can be missed in between the scans which we do. And also in a CSR, if in case like the leakage is something which is not shown on an octa. So an FFA is something which does pick up where the leakage is and so that enabling, enabling us to do the focal laser photocoagulation. So both have their roles, but then like uh, we are doing much more, much less FFA as compared to what we were doing earlier. Particularly vascular retinopathies like diabetic retinopathy or a vein occlusion or a tributary vein occlusion, the octa is able to show us much more information along with the age-related macular degeneration. The advantage of octa is in addition to the vascular network, we are able to get the structural OCT as well. So both these put together, it gives us much more information. But we cannot write off FFA and say that we don't, we won't do FFA at all. There is still a role for FFA in certain situations. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, next, we have talk on uh, diabetic retinopathy. What to look for and uh, when to refer. This is being uh, presented by Dr. Kaushik. Since the India is the diabetic capital of the world and most of the cases are received late. So what should be done? How it should be tackled? Dr. Kaushik, over to you. A very good evening to all of you. Uh, I'll be discussing a diabetic retinopathy for general ophthalmologist. So I have tried to keep the uh, presentation simple. So I'll be discussing why is diabetic retinopathy important and how, what to look for and how to manage and going to refer. So why is diabetic retinopathy important? As uh, Sridham already told, diabetes, the prevalence of diabetes is already increasing. India has the second highest number of diabetes after China. And only around 60% of cases with diabetes mellitus under, undergo recommended annual screening. It is happening in USA and obviously in India the percentage is much less. And if we can control the diabetic patients systemically and if you can diagnose the diabetic with diabetic macular edema early, it might improve their systemic and visual outcome. So what to look for? For general ophthalmologists, definitely if somebody is in the diabetic patient is saying that there is a recent onset of of vision, exclude cataract and diabetic macular edema. If there are floaters, exclude which is always secondary to that PDR, there may be a multiple other causes obviously. History of prior ocular treatments of the same eye and the other, and also response to therapy gives paramount information about uh, subsequent treatment and subsequent possible prognosis and uh, response to therapy. Existing history, including duration, medication, control, diabetes, monitors, and also comorbidity, specifically nephropathy. Nephropathy is an important comorbidity, and 
treating patients with uncontrolled hypertension or nephropathy is difficult. So, examination includes treatment examinations, di in diabetics, cornea, and specifically healing property of cornea might be erased. Many people might not dilate. There might be new vessels, very subtle new vessels in the pupillary margin, which we need to uh, look in undiluted exam. Gunioscopy should be done to check for new, new vessels in the angle. Obviously, pupillary dilation uh, might be poor and which might pose diff cause difficulty in cataract surgery and also examination of the posterior segment. Anterior vitreous examination can show whether the eye is vitreous hemorrhage or not. Also, there are some cases we have astral hyaluronic in vitreous hemorrhage, which might be detected in the anterior vitreous in sleep examination. What I plan to focus on is that fundus examination in 90D or 78D is very important because if you do only in the of the 20D, fatal changes might be missed, even with a very experienced eye. Other examinations as in all comprehensive eye exam include pupillary exam, intraocular pressure, ocular movement, ocular attacks, admixa, if there is any regurgitation of uh, pass uh, on pressure over uh, lacrimal sac, and also some cases, specifically patients with nephropathy, they might have severe pallor and pedal edema. So, fundus examination, this classification of diabetic retinopathy is very important, though there are various uh, definitions, uh, classifications available. So, usually what we use is that mild NPDL will have only microaneurysms and moderate NPDL will be between the mild and severe NPDL. In severe NPDL, there are uh, two different definitions, US and international, and in PDR, you are able to see that there is new vessels. There are new vessels in the disc or elsewhere, and due to new vessels, there might be vitreous hemorrhage, preretinal hemorrhage, or taxonal retinal retardment. So, and uh, CSME uh, was the classification given by uh, early treatment of diabetic treatment study, which was used previously when we did not have OCT, and it used to guide our laser. Now we are uh, usually classifying diabetic, diabetic mellitus, uh, diabetic macular edema into central involved and non-central involved. If there is central involved macular edema, then pharmacotherapy is usually planned. If there is non-central involved diabetic macular edema, then usually focal laser is planned. So how do we manage? OCT macula is an important investigation and if the general of the world has this OCT macula machine in their setup. They can definitely manage these uh, cases of diabetic macular edema. Uh, diabetic macular edema has been classified by many authors into different types. What we usually uh, see is that morphology, whether there is subretinal fluid, whether there is diffuse or spongiform edema, whether there is facial macular edema, whether there is vitreocular traction. This will define the plan of surgery. If there is vitreocular traction, then most likely they will need partial amitriptomy. If there is subretinal fluid, the response might be better with intravitreal steroids. So, closing, as uh, my sir already told, uh, OCTA has uh, is a non-invasive uh, imaging modality and you do not need to push a die and obvious, but many uh, general ophthalmologists might not have the access to FFA or OCTA. FFA is still uh, necessary to see if there are very fine new vessels. Unexplained vision loss, as uh, Dr. Apurba already showed, there were multiple cases which were diagnosed only after closing angiography. And it also differentiates DME from cytopathy uh, system macular edema. Systemic examination and systemic control is most crucial if you are not controlling uh, blood sugars. Then what, or, and other systemic diseases, whatever we do will not work. And also, if we are planning partial amitriptomy after anti behavior injection, patients should have good control because sometimes this happens that intravitreal injection inject, anti behavior has been given, but basically, we cannot take the patient for partial amitriptomy because the uh, system control gets deranged. That, that is why, where the crunch phenomena can occur, there might be tractions might worsen and the TRD might involve traction retinal detachment, might involve cobium, cobium might be detached. So, before planning uh, treatment, please control the blood sugars and other systemic status. 
So how do we manage? Because this is for general ophthalmologists. I have kept it simple. If it is diabetic macroedema, if it is central involved, plan for pharmacotherapy. If it is non central involved, plan for focal laser. Multiple anti BG regimes are available. Multiple uh, cost effective biosimilars have also come. Though there are some uh, certain uh, reports of intraocular inflammation with newer anti BG regimes. So steroids, including posterior subtenal transplant, are uh, cheap but cost uh, effective uh, therapy for this, though they do have uh, complications including glaucoma and cataract formation, which are usually manageable. So, if there is qualified to diabetes retinopathy, standard treatment remains management for the population, though recent uh, studies suggest that regular anti injections might control PDR and also might spare the peripheral, peripheral visual field. And there, uh, if some uh, some cases require personal electrophoring, and NDVG might be required before that. So, when to refer? So, this is for general ophthalmologists. Uh, this is the guideline by Indian uh, International Council of Ophthalmology uh, and IAPB. They have said that if there is severe NPDR or PDR referred to a retina specialist. Severe NPDR or PDR. Do not like follow up on your own setting. If you do not have management options, just refer them to a specialist who has lasers and DPG and OCT. And if there is DME, you have to refer the patient to a retina specialist. If you have OCT, you might give anti therapy. You you have the Expertise and if you have the uh, fellow, if you have done fellowship under this, and definitely before giving anti BGA, look for traction. If there is any traction, if there is a subtle TRV, that traction might worsen with anti BGA. You have to uh, better refer those cases to a retina specialist. So, my take home point will be always examine a patient with dilated pupil with 90D, controlled systemically. If you have nascent monetary fungus for OCT for pollution and geography, if there is DME and PDR or severe NPDR, refer to Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kaushik. It was a very wonderful presentation. And as we all are aware, uh, this is a very commonly con encountered condition, and a lot of general ophthalmologists do take up and uh, treat the cases. And maybe if it is beyond their scope, then a retina person is involved. So here I would like to request Dr. Manoj Khatri, sir. Sir, in your practice, how often do you see cases which were uh, sent to you maybe after uh, uh, after the condition has progressed? Like, uh, how often do you see such things? Yes. Uh, uh, good evening once again, everyone. And uh, <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Kaushik, for giving a very lucid uh, <clears throat> overview of uh, management of diabetic macular edema and diabetic retinopathy per se, which is a major public health burden. And <clears throat> uh, Vitrotna Society of India is also doing a lot many activities, uh, uh, you know, in this coming year, which are centered mainly around uh, uh, treating these patients early for both diabetic macular edema and diabetic retinopathy. And uh, especially post-COVID era, we see a lot of uncontrolled diabetics and they are coming very late. The presentation is quite late. So as Dr. Kaushik highlighted, the management surrounds under these four uh, protocols for a general ophthalmologist because we are you know, talking here about general ophthalmology management mm -hmm. of these patients. And as the, the threshold for referral uh, should be very less. So the moment you feel that this patient is not in your uh, uh, realm of treatment, that should be referred even for uh, cases of diabetic macular edema rather than they keep injecting them and waiting for an improvement or worsening. So that should be one of the major takeaway points. And definitely, is this uh, treatment burden is keep you know increasing day by day. And uh, uh, you know all of us are having many patients uh, in our OPD every day with uh, uh, diabetic retinopathies. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, next question to Dr. Chaitra, ma'am. Uh, Ma'am, with the emerging trend of uh, artificial intelligence, where do you see uh, the 
where, where do you see the tool taking over like how the general physicians non ophthalmologists <coughs> taking over the screening and management protocols i think uh, given the fact that uh, our country like you mentioned has one of the largest uh, diabetic uh, population in the world uh, we are uh, faced with an epidemic of sorts so i think ai is going to help uh, non physicians uh to screen for these uh, patients and if that can go into the community i think we can pick up these patients before they uh, develop irreversible vision loss a lot of the patients that come from the periphery who don't have access to screening who don't have access to retinologists come with very advanced disease uh, and at that point of time it's very difficult for us to really help them so if we can pick up uh, the disease early i think uh, ai is the way to go and dr kim and his team have worked so much about uh, picking up it from images i think image based screening and at least uh, you know triaging them into treatment or referable uh, dr uh, would be the way forward and uh, what do you think man uh, <clears throat> yeah not just the grading as such do you think uh, ai will also help in informing about the macular edema ischemia as well so that is again uh, you know we will need to depend on imaging and uh, that based on just uh, fundus cam uh, fundus images it sometimes little difficult so i think if it can at least uh, initially pick out what are the patients that who need to come to a specialist and when they need to come i think that's something else that we can uh, kind of educate our patients and give it as a program uh when you know you you feed in probably your uh, diabetes uh, duration your systemic status and then uh, it pushes you to come for a reminder to come for your screening i think that's something that we can uh you know look forward in the years to come but uh, macular ischemia and uh, i think that will really take some time because it's rather advanced we don't even have uh, patients with uh, full blown uh, you know clinically evident conditions coming to us so this would be a would probably still need a physician to be examining require an octa or an fa to give us more diagnosis okay thank you ma'am uh, dr ramakumar kumar sir i have I just wanted to ask did you in your clinical practice face a patient where you know you were the first one to break that yes you have a systemic problem you may be having diabetes and how do you counsel such patients and what is your way forward yeah uh, that kind of uh, patients are little uh, uh, uncommon because uh, like being being an ophthalmologist i would suggest everybody like other day we were having vrsi diabetic retinopathy session here in indore and at that time dr raju raman uh, was mentioning about what is called an opportunistic screening so whenever you are seeing a patient uh, in your opd uh, try to see the fundus uh, especially if the patient is a known diabetic so even if it is not uh, better if you uh, because most of the ophthalmic examinations uh, uh, are done at the, the optical shop or at the optometrist or if, even if they are visiting uh, that part fundus examination part is lacking so that opportunistic screening one should not leave and uh, as you said uh, those who are not known diabetics also they like or even a systemic disease especially these hypertensive retinopathies uh, we do pick up uh, most of the times uh, without a known history of hypertension diabetics uh, they are uh, as, as such they are not that uh, fast uh, progressing so by the time they we, we diagnose uh, almost all of them are uh, like known diabetics only but still we do encounter so uh, like every time i see a patient with uh, like uh, treatable or non treatable whatever if we can, if we can name them so depending on the situation uh, i would say uh, everything can wait first look at your systemic control so check your systemic status then only we better proceed for the treatment because there is nothing like uh, you are seeing now and you have to inject today itself or uh, you have to treat today itself so i impress upon the patient whether it is a previously known diabetic or not a known diabetic i impress upon the patient that first uh, checking the systemic status important and then depending on the condition of the eye then the next call can be taken how early we have to intervene uh, based on the systemic status so that's what i usually prefer okay sir uh tinku bali ma'am uh, any comments uh, before we move on to our next talk tinku is not here 
Uh, just one question I had, Team Sir, Manisha, Madam, and uh, Mahesh Sir. There's a hot topic. Should an antivirus injection, especially when in the case of diabetes, you know, the diabetes capital of the world, should it be given by a general ophthalmologist? If yes, then in which conditions? If no, then why? Universe, they... Because in tier three cities, it might be difficult for them to go to and visit a vitreous surgeon or uh, come to the tier one cities or tier two cities. So many of the general ophthalmologists give this reason. We have classified so, the, the, so much uh, into diabetic retinopathy, macular edema, made it so simplified, center involving, non-center involving. The OCT gives now a ready-made response to most of these things. So I just want uh, uh, the responses so that all of us can be on the same page. Srinivas, uh, today we don't have a choice. I think people have taken it on themselves to give the injections. The general ophthalmologists, many of them are giving uh, or treating these diabetic patients uh, even with laser and with injections because injections have become the easy way to do it. But what is important is to educate people because this is eventually going to happen, whether we like it or not. So it is very important, at least through such webinars, the importance or the guidelines for giving these injections is very, very important that they understand. So as retina specialists, we should stress on creating these guidelines for them because they will definitely start treating these patients. So it's, it is happening. And uh, so our role will be only in making sure that they get the right way to go treat these patients. Right. Nisha, Madam, and uh, Mahesh, sir, quick comments. Sir? Go ahead, Dr. So, I would totally agree with Kim, sir, that, uh, you know, I think every general ophthalmologist in today's time is having an OCT in his clinic and is right, left, and center managing patients of medical retina. So, it's really no point questioning whether they should be giving or not giving intravitreal injections because they, in any case, would be. So I would totally second what Kim sir is saying, that it is better that we educate them and train them well to follow various precautions, including an informed consent and all the aseptic precautions while they are giving intravitreal injections. I think that's extremely important. And that is why a lot of institutes are now very successfully running medical retina short-term fellowship programs also. The problem is when you know they are taken very casually, and they are being given, uh, you know, without taking due precaution is the time when it can cause a havoc because, you know, these injections are given in bulk. So I would totally agree that we need to educate and provide adequate guidelines for giving these intravitreal injections. I think general ophthalmologists in any case would be giving them. Dr. Kim and Dr. Manisha have pretty much told everything. I would uh, suggest that, like, in addition to doing the OCT, yeah, they should be a little bit familiar with clinical examination as well because proliferative diabetic retinopathy is something which can be missed. So that's something which is like better picked up on a clinical examination in contrast to just doing an OCT. And giving an injection in uh, proliferative diabetic retinopathy, yes, in the initial stages it may be okay, but then subsequently, parental photocoagulation is the treatment. And if in case you miss it, then there is a possibility the patient can end up much worse than what they began with. So in addition to doing an OCT, I would suggest that they do, do at least a posterior pull clinical examination with a slit lamp examination, as well as, if possible, an indirect proximoscopy. Right. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. I will we'll move on to the next talk now by Dr. Pradeep Sagar from uh, Shankrai Hospital, Shimoga. And he'll be speaking on the relevance of fundus examination before cataract surgery. Dr. Pradeep, please. Am I audible? Yeah, you are audible, Dr. Pradeep. Thank you. Uh, good evening, one and all. At the outset, I would like to thank AOS and BRSI for this opportunity. Today, I will be discussing the relevance of fundus examination before cataract surgery. Before I begin this presentation, like I would uh, uh, like to mention that fundus examination is actually an integral part of nuclear evaluation. And it's a, as an ophthalmologist, it's our duty to examine the fundus of every patient who consults us. It may not be possible in certain situations, such as in cases with uh, conjunctivitis or a keratitis, but uh, we should always make sure that once it's healed, we should try to look at the fundus and complete the ocular evaluation. 
So I will be discussing a few clinical scenarios, like in which if we fail to examine the fundus prior to cataract surgery, uh, we would be landing up in trouble. So the first scenario is an elderly gentleman who presented with a partial visual gain after cataract surgery in his right eye. His visual acuity was 6 by 24. The pre-surgical notes mentioned that the visual acuity was 4 by 60 in both the eyes and with a cataract of nuclear sclerosis grade 2 with PSC. When we examined the fundus, we could see that there was a central geographic atrophy with presence of drusen, which indicates that it's a case of age-related macular degeneration. So we advised the patient for regular follow-up. We advised for an LVA trial and error supplementation. I do agree that in this scenario, the cataract surgery was the only possible treatment at this point of time to improve his vision. However, what we have is a dissatisfied patient at the end. Whereas if we had done a pre-op fundus examination, it would have helped us in counseling the patient better regarding the poor post-op visual gain and the patient would have accepted it better. So the learning point would be a pre-op fundus examination would help in pre-operative counseling regarding the post-operative visual outcome, particularly in cases in which we may not be able to do anything much such as in lamellar hole, an outer retinal atrophy, macular scar, and optic atrophy. So moving on to another scenario, an elderly gentleman again presented with a partial visual gain in the left eye after cataract surgery with a visual acuity of 618. So the pre-surgical notes clearly show that the cataract was almost similar in both the eye, but the vision was thus in the left eye. So when we looked at the fundus, we could see that there was a macular hole and we advised him a parthenal vitrectomy with internal limiting membrane peeling, but the patient did not come for follow-up. So in this scenario, the patient was supposed to require an additional intervention for his retinal condition. And if we had examined this fundus earlier, it would have allowed us in planning a combined surgery and could have avoided the need for an additional intervention. And the patient would have accepted the prognosis better. So the learning point would be that a pre-op fundus examination helps in planning additional intervention if required along with cataract surgery, such as in cases with a macular hole, epiretinal membrane, a vitro macular traction, or a traction or retinal detachment. Sometimes it may be a sequential, sequential surgery, but the patient would be better informed about it. So moving on to another scenario, elderly lady, a diabetic and a hypertensive, presented with partial visual gain after cataract surgery with the visual acuity of 6 by 18. The visual acuity was just around 624 with a PSC, which was documented in the pre-surgical notes. When we saw the fundus, we could see that there was macular edema and there's a possibility that it may be a diabetic macular edema, which would be aggravated after cataract surgery. So it required an intravitreal anti or a steroid. So in this scenario, the pre-existing condition actually worsened following cataract surgery. So we should be looking at the fundus earlier and if possible, we should treat it earlier rather than going ahead with the cataract surgery. So the learning point would be that cataract surgery can worsen certain pre-existing retinal conditions. For example, macular edema, as we, see now, as we saw now, it may be in diabetic macular edema or vein occlusion related macular edema due to the post-operative inflammation. The other condition would be a worsening of vitreo macular traction. A peripheral RD can progress rapidly. A peripheral harsh tear can progress rapidly due to progression of the posterior vitreous detachment, which we see after cataract surgery. Another scenario, an elderly gentleman, a diabetic hypertensive, presented with pain, blurred vision in the left eye, 20 days after cataract surgery and the visual acuity was 1 by 60. Pre-surgical clinical notes showed that the visual acuity was somewhere around 3 by 60 in that time and it showed that it was a nuclear sclerosis grade 3 with a pseudo exfoliation. The intraoperative notes mentioned that there was zonular dialysis and an iris clock IOL was implanted. So in this situation, when we saw the patient, we, we saw that there was corneal edema, neovascularization of the iris and an IOP of 48 millimeter of mercury. And when we saw the fundus, there were tortuous veins and scattered hemorrhages, which indicate that it's a neovascular glaucoma secondary to old CRVO. So in this scenario, actually the cataract surgery accelerated the development of NVI and NVA. 
So in such situation, if we have seen the fundus, we can either plan a pre-operative anti-VEGF or post-operatively we can monitor closely and plan a PRP or an anti-VEGF therapy. So the learning point would be that, so I always consider that cataract surgery and retinal ischemia is a high risk combination. And particularly if the retinal ischemia is associated with an aphakia or a communication between the anterior segment and posterior segment, it's a deadly combination. So it allows the migration of proangiogenic factors into the anterior chamber and it can result in uh, early development of uh, neovascularization of the iris or NVA. So we should be very careful while handling cases with PDR, old CRBO or ocular ischemic syndrome. So what are the challenges in fundus evaluation in IC with cataract? For example, if there is a posterior subcapsular cataract, the details of the fovea would be hazy when we see through a lip lamp biomicroscopy. But we should always try to see through a clear area. For example, here there is a paracentral clear area which would give a better view of the fovea. For example, in cases with dense nuclear sclerosis, for example, like this, we it's quite difficult to see the fundus in a slip lamp biomicroscopy, but Indirect ophthalmoscope gives a better visualization of the retina even in such cases. We see that a few resort to ultrasonography when they see a dense cataract. But what we need to understand is ultrasonography can detect if the retina is attached or detached or there are any vitreous echoes. But indirect ophthalmoscopy can detect findings such as optic atrophy, vascular occlusion, even in cases with hazy media and dense nuclear sclerosis. So an indirect ophthalmoscope scopy should always be considered in such situations. In cases with poor visibility of fovea, we can consider OCT. For example, this is a case in which there is dense astride halo, this astride halosis. And here we can see that there are a few scattered hemorrhages, but you are not sure about the foveal status. But on OCT, we can see that there is presence of macular edema. And we can also see this astride halosis, which is casting shadow. In cases in which there is no visibility of retina, we should try to do an ultrasonography because it can pick up things like retinal detachment, vitreous hemorrhage, and intraocular mass, which can help us in planning treatment better rather than just doing a cataract surgery. So I would like to summarize and again, uh, like, uh, again mention this point that fundus examination is an integral part of ocular evaluation. And all efforts should be made to know the status of retina before planning the cataract surgery. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pradeep. That was excellent. I think very precise and to the point to what was required here. Uh, if I could get in Dr. Anand here. Uh, so just like Dr. Pradeep mentioned about ultrasonography, in cases of white cataract or very dense cataract, when you are not able to examine the fundus, uh, what role do you think does examination of the contralateral eye or exam subtle findings, subtle findings like iris neovascularization, looking for them, have in making your decision making for these patients? Absolutely. First of all, I think uh, both these presentations uh, and explain vision loss and this particular presentation, fundus examination, is critical, I think. And I congratulate the uh, <clears throat> committee for putting these two up. So I think. Uh, very important. Uh, this is something we keep repeating and reiterating to various uh, forum that, and as uh, Pradeep has repeatedly reiterated, fundus examination is an integral part of the ocular examination. So this, I mean, uh, needs to be underscored for sure. But then also I'd like to just throw in another point is that very often a good pupillary examination is important. Very often, unfortunately, in this day and time with a lot of imaging and a lot of technology, a lot of people, uh, even anti segment colleagues, uh, do not do a adequate, uh, you know, pupillary examination. I think that is very important. Because that will give you a great clue about what's going on behind. Sometimes we will be surprised that after, uh, you know, mature cataract surgery, there's a detachment, retinal detachment, chronic detachment, behind, which could have been made up. So I think uh, that's one thing. Before we go to the fundus, uh, good pupillary examination needs to be that needs to be underscored. Then of course, definitely uh, looking at the other eye uh, is important. Uh, so, uh, uh, I mean, even if the vision is good, uh, telltale signs of an old retinal uh, slow occlusion or uh, AMD, uh, drusens, intense drusens, all this is important. The reason this whole talk is there is important, it's important for uh, everybody, uh, us as well as anterior segment colleagues, to temper expectations. That's the most important thing. 
people generally go with the uh, conception that you know cataract surgery patient is 66 the next day so it's important for them to understand that you're just removing a, a media opacity and uh, vision is actually determined by sapnin and the retina of the macula specifically so i think a good uh, uh, contralateral eye examination pupillary examination is important and uh, i'm of the belief that if uh, mature cataracts are uh, i would uh, you know strongly suggest doing a uh, ultrasonography before going in for uh, you know cataracts because a lot of patients are now going in for premium eye results so uh, that's just be interesting right thank you sir you got the point of eye well then if i could ask dr chaitra here so uh, what are the fundus conditions that you would say that would alter the choice of your eye well for a general ophthalmologist if they are planning a premium eye well multifocal toric what are the fundus conditions that you say would alter that choice for you for the ophthalmologist so i think uh, because of the expectation that these uh, patients have after uh, opting for premium eyes a uh, lot of us were skeptical uh, initially about going for uh, any patients expecting to have chronic macular disorders be it uh, you know diabetic macular edema or uh, rvo so there is a lot of concern whether we should really go ahead with these uh, trifocals and panoptical lenses but uh, over the last uh, few years i would say a year or two uh, many uh, people who practice both uh, cataract and vitreous uh, surgery like uh, shrinivas here himself have shown that it really doesn't make too much of a difference as long as you've counseled these patients well enough and they know you know what to expect because they might have perfectly normal maculas at the time of the surgery but eventually de- develop uh, diabetes or other macular conditions which brings down their vision as long as they are aware that it's not secondary to the eye hole i don't think it really ma- matters much uh, i am still uh, you know very worried when i do uh, advise these patients because they come and ask us back as uh, retina uh, physicians their primary uh, treating doctors whether i can go ahead with an advanced uh, lens as long as they are aware of the consequences i think it's quite okay many of them still do pretty okay with uh, advanced lenses especially someone who's never worn glasses and would like to have a uh, spectacle free vision and they are well counseled it's still fine to go ahead i could ask dr rama kumar here so uh, do you feel that if some patient with a multifocal eye well or one of these trifocal eye wells and you were operating that patient for a condition post cataract surgery does it make a difference to your surgery uh, does it make it a little more difficult or simpler i did operate uh, such cases uh, i didn't find much of a difficulty uh, because uh, like we we I, i used to feel before i operated on these patients that may be a difficulty but uh, the difference between those uh, rings uh, when you are visualizing it's not that much so you don't feel that uh, kind of a, a gr- drastic uh, difference between those uh, steps between those rings so i didn't find much of a difficulty in these cases and uh, regarding uh, them going for the multifocals i think uh, still uh, many uh, of us are uh, hesitant uh, uh, as dr chaitra has already mentioned uh, better to counsel them and uh, let them choose because we, we may have to op- operate a combined surgery also and at that time if you are uh, planning for a multifocal then and there i don't know i haven't uh, done that kind of a case but already implanted uh, months before or years before and then uh doing a vitrectomy surgery i did do i did uh, the, those surgeries but i didn't find much of a difference right thank you just to add a few points uh, simar i think uh, very yeah. well put by dr chaitra and dr ramakumar sir uh there are something called as the relative contraindications and the absolute contraindication something if you have like a uh, dusenoid pd you already have a geographical atrophy and you know that there is a the evidence of the the wet amd i think these comes under the absolute contraindications where absolutely we have to tell the cataract surgeons not to put the multifocals or the trifocals or even extended depth of focus i will support now comes is the question is when the patient is having moderate npdr not having a dmd and that patient wants to go in for a multifocal in that eye because the other eye already has a multifocal eye hole so they have at that point of time very less choice and still that becomes a relative kind of contraindication where they can still go because we know that we have plethora of antivegfs now available in the market and now we have long acting antivegfs also now coming into the market i don't think that are really an absolute contraindication but again it's a better patient counseling 
what we need to do and make the patient understand that in future he might go into these things which might require the treatment. Now coming into the surgical part, I, I agree with Dr. Ramakumar sir. Initially when I operated on most of these multifocal liovels, when we are doing a retinal detachment surgery, we usually don't have much problem. Because of these wide angle visualizations, they are having the best wide angle visualizations. They usually don't. But uh, recently when I did a macular surgery uh, to one of these patients, uh, there is a difference in the depth of focus. Sometimes if you just move the instrument back into the vitreous, you see what was described in the literature is the ghost images, the wave shaped images or the arc shaped images that can be seen sometimes. It's not that you cannot uh, do a macular surgery. Definitely you can feel the ERM, you can feel the ILM, but definitely that kind of little bit of focus disturbance, the focus will be there. So to Especially test out, what people have suggested is to use a viscoat on the anterior surface of the IOL or post the viscoat on the posterior coat of the IOL. By doing so, we get away with these most of these uh, ghost images what we are doing. Yes, Mahesh sir, comments. Can I make a brief comment? Like wherever we think the patient vision is not going to improve to 6.6 six or 6.5, in those patients, I think better to avoid these premium IOLs. Say, for instance, patient has had a retinal attachment surgery or a myopic macular degeneration, where we think that the patient's vision is not going to come up to the normal level, then probably it may be uh, kind of waste to put a premium IOL, which may not benefit the patient, is what uh, I would think. Right. Thank you for this comment, sir. Last question to Dr. Kim before we go on to the next talk. So, uh, we have a comment in the chat also. Would you recommend an OCT for all patients undergoing cataract surgery? Or would you say a good clinical exam is good enough in today's day and age? Definitely a good clinical exam is as good as before. The OCT will be indicated, especially when you're doing a premium IOL, just to be sure that you're, you know, you're dealing with the, you're going to give a good outcome to the patient. That's the only reason you would probably do a preoperative OCT. But also in those where you suspect pathologies, definitely a preoperative OCT is, uh, is a must because you can prognosticate to the patient what the visual acuity could be postoperatively. So counseling can be better with this. Right. And if you find yeah. a pathology, like you find a DME on... OCT and or a pre-op exam. Treating that DME along with cataract, would you recommend doing a uh, like an anti-VEGF or a DEX implant by the general ophthalmologist or would you want a retinal surgeon to do that? I would prefer a retinal surgeon to decide, obviously, to yeah. decide, you know, based on the OCT findings, based on the edema, uh, what injections to be given. I Personally, would say give a trial of injections before you go with the combination of cataract surgery and uh, uh, anti VEGF injection. That's what I would do. Hey, thank you, sir. Thank you. So yeah, much. Dr. Simar, I have one thing to add here. Uh, now that we are uh, discussing for the day, general ophthalmologist's sake, when uh, because previously uh, there used to be uh, um, uh, guidelines of uh, doing a macular laser before going for a cataract surgery or a PRP laser before going for a cataract surgery. Uh, I say that uh, that standard still uh, is valid, but at the same time, when there is a, a significant cataract, we can always impress upon the patient uh, with a good systemic control uh, that uh, immediately after the surgery also we can go for that PRP laser uh, rather than, uh, or if at all, as uh, Mahesh sir already mentioned, uh, if there are no elevated NVEs or FEPs, uh, we can think about uh, giving uh, an injection along with the uh, cataract surgery rather than uh, struggling uh, for us to do those prp lasers and uh, and and, and uh, improper or insufficient lasers before going for cataract surgery so in, in, within a short time after the surgery the patient has to undergo the treatment and the evaluation that we have to impress upon and we can safely go for the cataract surgery when it is significant enough thank you thank you very much uh, so now we'll move on to the next part which is the sh uh, saransh before uh, uh, Dr. Devesh and Dr. Bhavik, the last two speakers, take away. Uh, so, as I explained earlier, it is uh, giving a gist of the journal articles uh, from the important uh, retinal journals to give it to the general ophthalmologist. What are the take-home points and what's very important for their practice? So, for that, we have uh, none other than Dr. Uh, Vishali Gupta, an accomplished uh, VR surgeon and UVI expert of international repute. Uh, 
uh, working as the chief of uh, ret uh, retina and uvia services at pgi and i uh, request you to please uh, go ahead with the uh, the journal articles giving them and this is the second episode what we have started from aios erc so tinku joins me in welcoming uh, all of you for this thank you thank you srinava simar tinku everybody on board the topic that i was given is what are the important recent clinical trials in retina would would have an impact for a comprehensive ophthalmologist in the day to day practice management i just thought to myself what it would be that would be most important for a comprehensive ophthalmologist and just now we heard the panel discussion where everybody agreed that there is no doubt that comprehensive ophthalmologists should be managing diabetics macular edema pdr giving injections and doing laser now let's first look at diabetic macular edema Srinivas said it's so easy these days that everybody knows that you look at the OCT and Manisha said everybody has OCT so you look at the OCT if the macular edema is involving the center it needs anti vgf injection if it is not involving the center laser may be considered so we all understand this is fair enough this is how it is now the questions which general ophthalmologist or anybody for that matter would have it are the critically three questions the first one of them is what is the anti vgf of choice is there any difference in the outcome between different drugs and we have protocol t telling us that the second one is will switch from a less expensive like you may want to begin with the less expensive more on to the move to the more expensive ones if you are not having good results there is protocol ac and then should we inject even if the vision is 20 30 or better and we are just seeing macular edema on oct that is virtually significant dme and not clinically significant dm so let's look at these one by one the first is the protocol t which compared the results of three well known anti vegf that is ranibizumab aflibercept and avastin they studied 660 eyes and they found and this is the result you know you will see all across when people talk about the trials that aflibercept showed the greatest improvement and the mean 13 plus letters gained which was lesser with ranibizumab and even lesser with bevacizumab however when you go at two years because diabetes is not a short term disease so when you go at two years aflibercept and ranibizumab did not have any differences yet bevacizumab remained inferior to aflibercept but not to ranibizumab now what is the caveat the caveat is that the more expensive drugs worked better in the subset of patient who had a poorer acuity at presentation so if the vision was 20 50 or better at the baseline there was actually no difference whatever anti vgf you may decide to use and the real life implication is that most of our patients in the early stage have moderate visual loss bevacizumab would work as well as the more expensive ones which include ranibizumab and aflibercept however if you have the poorer acuity at presentation aflibercept is likely to have better outcomes it's easier said than done there is a lot of cost difference between the two medications so the next logical question would be what about the step approach like i want to start with bevacizumab give it a try if it works good if it does not i would switch over to more expensive ones 
in the non-responder. But the question is, if the step approach works, the first question is, does it work? And second is, if it works, what should be the criteria for switch? And we have protocol AC by DRC.net, which beautifully answered these questions. They had the patient that were either given bevacizumab and then transitioned to aflibercept at around three months or later, or the second group just received aflibercept monotherapy right from the beginning. They did find that about 70% by the end of two years in the bevacizumab group did need a switching to aflibercept. However, again, we look at the caveat. The caveat is that when you look at the two ears, the mean change in the visual acuity from the baseline was about 14.7 letters if you gave aflibercept right from the beginning and 15 letters, actually one letter more, if you started with bevacizumab and you found that bevacizumab was not working, you switched over to aflibercept. So it means the switch works. So we can start with bevacizumab and if it doesn't work, switch on to aflibercept or other anti-VGF, the newer ones. But what should be the switch criteria? The protocol used three switch criteria. One, if there was persistent center involving DME. Second, you have an eye which is well treated, adequately treated, responding to therapy, but somewhere along the line, which may happen at any point of time, one year, one and a half year, the administration of bevacizumab you have been giving for the last two consecutive visits, but there is no recent improvement in the eye condition, either in terms of improvement in the visual acuity or decrease in the central thickness, which means the eye is kind of responding initially, but is not now responding. You may like to switch, or there is a suboptimal vision, which is not improving. So now we know uh, that uh, the protocol we, uh, sorry, sorry about this. So this protocol AC taught us very clearly that we do have the criteria to switch, uh, starting with the less expensive one, bevacizumab, and moving forward. When we talk of trials, which are kind of our major trials when we talk of anti-VGF, that is rise and right, which dealt with renibizumab, and then there were Vivid and Vista, which dealt with aflibercept. However, both these trials excluded patients who had good vision. And a general ophthalmologist or even retinologist are often faced with this dilemma. You do an OCT, OCT shows you macular edema, the patient is 6'9 or 6'6, six, six, reading fine, has no complaints. Now, should I treat this virtual macular edema? Because this edema does not fit into sometimes into clinically significant macular edema, which generally uh, we all learned through ETTRS. Protocol, we address this question. So they took patient who had center involving DME, more than 250 micron on time domain OCT, and the vision was 20-25 or better. They randomized subject into three arms. One group received a flavor sip, second received focal or grid laser, and third was just observed. So across all arms, the proportion of patients who lost the five lines of visual acuity at two, five letters, sorry, not five lines, five letters of visual acuity at two years was similar in all the three groups. That was 16 letters in the a flibercept, 17 in the laser, and 19 if you just don't do anything. 
So the real world implication is that if the patient has center involving DME and good vision, it can be managed initially just with observation and close follow-up. Coming, switching gears and moving on to proliferative diabetic retinopathy, we all know that we want to do something here because the complacence leads on to a situation like this. So there is protocol S and there is a lot of talk and Dr. Mahesh uh, just mentioned about the careful need of giving anti-VGF monotherapy in patients with PDR. So the question is PRP or monotherapy with anti-VGF. Protocol S answered this question beautifully by randomizing a total of 305 patients into two groups. First group received renibizumab and PRP was given if they felt renibizumab was not working. Second group received PRP. Both the groups were given renibizumab if required for diabetic macular edema. Now, when we look at two-year results, there was an advantage of giving renibizumab because the letter improvement was plus two versus not so much improvement, which was 0.2 in the PRP group. However, when we go to five-year results, renibizumab had low rate of development of macular edema. So I think these anti-VEGF act improving the visual acuity because they do help in managing macular edema. I'm showing you an example of this patient treated with monotherapy, no PRP, and it's magical. Believe me, it's just magical. Everything just disappears and you see a very good response. However, the problem is that these areas of capillary non-perfusion are still there and you got to stop this treatment at some point of time. What is going to happen when you stop the anti-VEGF, whether you give it for two years or whatever protocol you follow, you have to stop it sometime. So that is the caveat. It's not a durable therapy. Once that effect wears off and the vessels start growing again, patients come back actually with more florid retinal new vascularization, vitreous hemorrhage, retinal detachments, and real world implication is that PDR can be treated with anti-VGF therapy and you will see many conference people showing all these beautiful results. However, if ever you decide to do that, it needs a very close monitoring or safer to combine with PRP. The top one shows macular edema, new vascularization. The bottom one shows following anti-VGF and PRP therapy. The results are less magical, but it is definitely much safer than monotherapy. The latest trend these days, I'm just going to take two, three more minutes, is non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy. Could anti-VGF therapy halt the disease progression? I will not go into the details of protocol W because honestly, the message which I would like to give to the comprehensive ophthalmologist is it's still functionally beneficial to wait and not start injecting in the NPDR group to prevent the or delay the onset of PDR. AMD, we have the dry form and we have the wet form. We are really looking forward to this therapy for dry form, which is approved by FDA, but is not available, so I won't discuss. The wet form, I'm sure all of you find it very confusing because every two days there is either a new biosimilar or a new trial or a new molecule which comes up. I'm not going to talk about those. I will just tell you one thing, that only most of these studies which are coming, they are all non-inferior studies, non-inferior to the standard, and the standard is Marina and Anchor. This was the trial of Renibizumab, which set up a gold standard. 
and all the new molecules, whether it is brolicizumab or it is fericimab, they are actually marking non-inferiority study of treatment, means they are non-inferior to Lucentis or they are comparable to Lucentis, then why this hype? The hype is about lesser the frequency of injections. You may not have to inject them every monthly because we want to prolong the interval. So that is what it is all about. So comprehensive ophthalmologist, you can go over these trials if you want to switch, but be careful of the side effects which may be coming along the way. So we do have different studies and brolicizumab, some incidences of inflammation and uh, uh, retinal vasculitis. So some of these new drugs you have to take, but overall all the reports with biosimilars are quite encouraging. So to conclude, don't treat diabetic macular edema with very good vision. Switch can be made from brolicizumab to renibizumab or aflibercept. Don't treat NPDR yet. Anti-VGF monotherapy for PDR produces, I would say, dramatic results. But I will still not do it and better to combine with the PRP. And newer drugs for AMD offer advantage of lesser injection. They are not essentially superior because we have not had superiority trials yet. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, madam. Yeah, I think I'm, you covered. I'm the most trying to stop share one sec. Just give me a moment. I think she comprehensively covered it very nicely in 15 minutes. Thank you very much, madam. Uh, so when you were talking about the protocol AC, that is the switch. Where uh, there is... Yeah, one sec. Yes. Sorry about this. Yeah. Uh, Maybe the webinar administrator can do that. Yeah, I could do it. Fine. Yeah. So, yeah. So, yes, madam, sir. when you're talking about the switch, that is the protocol AC, where the non-responsive to bevazumab after two or more injections in the center involving macular edema, but in the real world scenario, would you still go up the ladder, go to ranibizumab and then a flibber set or taking no, no, the clinical no. implications, would you suggest general ophthalmologists to go in for the osrodex, uh, the dex implants, which have uh, the better this thing and what is your considerations for switching to these dex implants uh, apart from the anti vegf therapy? If you ask my personal opinion, I don't switch. Uh, I just go to osrodex. You know? So, but but then we do not use a Vastin. Uh, we we generally use biosimilars or whatever the brands are available. So to me, switching honestly, uh, it doesn't make much of a difference. If I have given free drugs, which is an anti VGF, and I'm not thinking of tachyphylaxis, I'm thinking that it's just not responding to anti VGF, and I see some uh, HRF serous fluid and CME, I just want to reduce the fluid. And I know my DEX implant would at least bring it down. So I would just bring it down with DEX implant and then follow it up with NTVGF in future, if I wish to. Thank you, thank you, madam. Uh, just a quick question before Simar uh, takes it over uh, to the expert panel. We keep on, uh, the, the, the patients keep responding to the macular edema. We keep on injecting or pumping anti-VGF injection. So what is the role of the targeted lasers? When you do an FFA, you see a non-perfusion, you do a targeted laser, does it hypothetically, which says that it's the disease of the periphery where you first do the laser and then the VEGF level comes down. So does the macular edema comes down and the, the frequency of the injection comes down. So has it really worked for anyone, the targeted laser and is it still advisable? Nisha, Madam, Dr. Manoj, Dr. Anand. So as far as targeted laser is concerned, I think it still has a role, especially for non-center involving DME. I think that is where I would really opt for a focal laser. Uh, as far as the center involving DME is concerned, I think all of us would agree probably that our first choice would be an anti-VEGF or an Ozodex implant. And probably we'll keep away, keep away from a focal laser. 
But when we are having patients with a good vision, we know that it's very adjacent, though it is still a non-center involving DMA, and we don't want that edema to progress subsequently and cause a fall of vision. I think those would be the situations where I would surely opt and do an FFA, localize the leaking microaneurysms, and surely try and treat them with a focal laser. Right. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. And now in the interest of... Anand, sir, wanted to put a point. Go ahead, sir. Sorry. Uh, no, I, I... My understanding was uh, from Srinivasan's question, it was treating uh, mm -hmm. peripheral no? uh, ischemic areas for uh, DME, right? Exactly. So I have dabbled in that for uh, refractory DME, uh, not yeah. for regular DME. And I mean, I found uh, unequivocal response. Some cases there's a response, but it wasn't like a magic bullet for everything. So, uh, and I know that there have been some presentations over the last decade in the RSI. Uh, so there have been free papers where uh, some people have reported uh, marginal improvements. And there's been a publication also to that effect. But I haven't seen that make a huge difference. So to answer your question there. Yeah. Sorry, I misunderstood it, Srinivas. I took no, it as no, 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 no. But as far as, but I think that concept of targeted laser and just targeting the ischemic areas is a dangerous one. Because those patients, I've seen a few patients who've come back with a lot of very aggressive looking PDR subsequently. So I think whenever we are opting for a PRP, uh, I think it should be a complete PRP. And if you are planning to do a targeted laser for the management of DME, as Anand mentioned, I think I also again have a question mark to it that how much of a response do we get with that? Thank you so much. Over to Simar and uh, Sriram. Thank you so much, ma'am, uh, for sharing some evidence-based guidelines and answering very targeted questions that the journal ophthalmologists might have. In the interest of time, we'll move on to the next talk now. Uh, that's by Dr. Devesh Kumawat. He is Assistant Professor in Vitro Retina Services at the RP Center, New Delhi. Uh, he'll be talking on role of retinal surgeon in management of cataract complications, PCR, nucleus drop, and Irwin gas syndrome. Dr. Devesh, please. Yes. Uh, are my slides visible? Yeah, they are. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Simha. Uh, at the outset, I would like to thank uh, AIS and VRSI for providing me the opportunity. So cataract surgery, as we all know, is the most common and uh, safe and successful ophthalmic surgeries, yet some side threatening complications can occur, which are of interest to a VR surgeon, namely vitreous loss and lens matter drop, vitreous traction induced retinal breaks and retinal detachment, Irwin gas syndrome, suprachoroidal hemorrhage and post-surgical endophthalmitis. Post-surgical endophthalmitis will be covered in the subsequent talk, so I'll touch upon the initial four. So the manage, goals of management in a PCR with vitreous loss are three, that you remove any vitreous from the anterior segment safely, remove all the remaining lens fragments safely, and implant an IOL safely. So the standard approach to managing a prolapse vitreous is anterior vitrectomy. We usually do it through the limbal route with the highest possible cut rate on the system available. We should maintain a stable anterior chamber and interocular pressure so that further vitreous prolapse does not occur. It can be done with or without an uh, active infusion in place. We can use the diluted triamcinolone to highlight the vitreous fibrils. And the ultimate game is, gain, uh, aim is to uh, perform an adequate and safe vitrectomy. So adequate means that you should remove all the vitreous from the anterior chamber and any vitreous above the posterior capsular plane. And there should not be any fibril going into the wound and it should be safe. You should, your cutter should always be pointing upward. It should not be pointing laterally or it should not be pointing downward so that excessive vitreous removal and excessive vitreous hydration does not occur. Now, another approach for anterior vitrectomy could be a pars planar approach. Here, instead of making the limbal incisions, you can make a port entry into the pars planar area and using a vitrectomy cutter, if there is a, 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 a posterior segment system available, you can use a, a, a small gauge vitrectomy system and perform the anterior vitrectomy from the pars planar route. Now, it may be a more controlled way. The perceived benefits of such a approach will be that it's more logical that you remain behind the PC plane and suck in all the vitreous that is coming anteriorly and cut it. It removes any AC manipulation because you are not entering through the wounds. It reduces the risk of further vitreous incarceration 
And if you have a posterior segment uh, system available with you, you can use very high cut rates to ensure safe vitrectomy and remove all the lens matter from the anterior vitreous area as well. So whatever technique you follow, you follow, you should follow up the patient uh, closely for the next few months because there is high incidence of retinal breaks and retinal detachment, five to ten folds. So a dilated fundus examination is must. And at the first instance of you, if you note anything suspicious, you should refer the patient to a retina surgeon. Now, if the lens fragments are remaining and they go behind the plane of posterior capsule, then the ball is in the coat of the retinal surgeon. You should not attempt any retrieval of these fragments from behind the plane of posterior capsule as this can lead to inadvertent retinal tear formation and retinal detachment. So now after review, removing all the lenticular matter from the anterior chamber and the capsular area, you should implant an IOL if capsular support is present and suture the main wound. That is very important. Now, the indications for further surgery for a re uh, remnant lens fragments will depend on multiple things. Primarily, what is the amount and what is the size of the nuclear or the lenticular matter that has fallen behind. So if it is a nuclear matter, 20% or roughly 2 mm of nuclear fragment which has gone behind or intraocular inflammation is very severe on the follow-up or the pressures are raised despite medication, maximum topical medication and oral medication, or the patient is developing systemic uh, systolic macular edema, or there are associated complications, then you go ahead for surgery. Now, why does nuclear matter inside more reaction is that it is more sequestered, it is more antigenic than the apinuclear antigens and cortical. The nuclear being containing more insoluble proteins, it incite more immune response. Now, whether to go ahead with the immediate surgery or a delayed surgery, it will totally depend on whether you have a retina surgeon backup available or not. And secondly, whether the media per clarity permits the surgery. Now, there are different studies that have shown that uh, uh, the, it could be performed immediately or it could be performed lactively. So this is the meta-analysis of all the studies and what this uh, meta-analysis uh, systematic review and meta-analysis say is that the earlier vitrectomy you perform, the better patient outcomes you achieve. And the outcomes, they worsen for each additional one week of vitrectomy delay. So it is important that the anterior segment surgeon refer the patients timely to the posterior segment surgeon. But here is a caveat that emergent surgery on day one and day two can lead to inferior outcomes. The outcomes may not be very good if you perform the elective surgery on day one or day two instead of day three to day seven. It perhaps could be because of the media clarity again that the surgery remains compromised and therefore the outcomes are not good. So the recommendations from that uh, single systematic review and meta-analysis is that the same day PPV, you can have dichotomous results. Next day, next few days, usually the outcomes are poorer and it is best that you perform a vitrectomy within three to seven days. So for the anterior segment surgeons, you should refer the patient as early as possible. Don't keep on waiting for the inflammation and the intraocular pressures to subside. The preoperative planning and then the elective surgery is of utmost importance. Fundus assessment should be performed at repeated intervals. Also before planning for the elective surgery as uh, you don't want any untoward uh, surprises uh, intraoperatively. Manage the intraocular pressure well. Don't take a patient for surgery when the pressures are raised. Otherwise, intraoperative, you can have supracoroidal hemorrhages if the pressures are raised. Important is that you suture the wound at the, at the time of uh, uh, PC, when you're managing the PCR and there is a remnant uh, lens matter drop. Otherwise, if you have not sutured it, then it becomes an issue because when you are giving subtenant block, when you are giving perivalvular block for the subsequent surgery, then the wound may gape, may leak and lead to suprachoroidal hemorrhage or other complications. So it is better in those conditions to suture the wound first in topical anesthesia and then top up it with subtenant or perivalvular block. Now the methods of removal, it can be removed using a vitrectomy cutter alone if the fragments are nuclear, small nuclear or uh, cortical pieces. Fragmentome may be required if they are denser lens fragments and larger. And for very dense, you can either impel and deliver or uh, levitate using PFCL and deliver them. The key steps during surgery is to perform an adequate retractomy so that there are no vitreous fibrils that could come into the fragmentome and vitreous traction is exerted. Now, PVD induction, it is ideal, but if you're not able to induce it PVT, then at least perform a very thorough peripheral vitrectomy and base excision in the area of sclerotomy. PFCL may be used to cushion the macula, but it is not absolutely required. 
and at the end of surgery always inspect the periphery for retinal breaks so this is the first video of a patient who had a near total of uh, nuclear matter drop and it's uh, quite hard and after doing the core vitrectomy uh, we can gently nudge the nucleus to see whether there is a vitreous sheet underlying it then tricot we are using here to identify and help in pvd induction once the pvd is induced then you enlarge the opening of the hyaloid and then the nucleus matter can uh, fall behind the vitreous skirt and it becomes very freely mobile then you complete the vitrectomy complete the pvd perform anterior vitrectomy and uh, then a base excision in the area where you want to make a sclerotomy. So here we are making a sclerotomy and then through the sclerotomy incision, a phacophragmatome tip without a sleeve that is uh, that passes easily through that sclerotomy incision. And then you use your non-dominant hand instruments to help in the chopping. And you use low, low to moderate vacuum so as to avoid collapse of the globe because it's a large bore. And you use uh, FICO power as per titrated as per the hardness of the nucleus. The remaining small lenticular pieces can then be taken with the help of the cutter. Now, again, it is important uh, here to uh, remind that uh, peripheral examination is very important at, as itrogenic breaks can have occurred during the surgery. Now, the condition may not always be said that simple, and uh, this may be the case. And the anterior segment surgeon should not keep on waiting for the corneal clarity to improve or the intraocular pressures to reduce and then only refer the patient for surgery. Sometimes we may have to take up uh, such con patients in such condition also. And then in, in, for improving the visibility in the intraoperative period, we may have to scrape off the epithelium. And because it is always better to have good media clarity to perform the surgery, otherwise complications can occur. Now, in rare scenarios, we can use PFCL also to levitate after doing a thorough vitrectomy. We can inject the PFCL, bring the uh, uh, nucleus anteriorly, coat the endothelium, and then remove it under uh, uh, using a wire vectors and positive pressure from behind. So in the post-operative period, it is important that we watch out for uh, intense inflammation, serous choroidals due to wound leak, retinal detachments can still happen, and secondary glaucoma. Now, since vitreous loss uh, has an increased risk of uh, retinal breaks forming and uh, retinal detachment up to uh, 5 to 10 folds, we should closely observe monthly these patients for the initial few months with a dilated fundus examination. But then it is important that the examination may not always be possible uh, for an anterior segment surgeon because of the cap ca capsular opacification or remnant cortical matters or poor midresses. So in case of any doubt, it should be referred to a retinal surgeon for indentation in direct ophthalmoscopy. And uh, pseudofig RDs often tend to develop uh, because of multiple peripheral breaks at the posterior margin of vitreous base, and vitrectomy is a uh, is a better option for uh, such cases. Now, coming to Irvin gas syndrome, it is the macular edema that develops after a cataract surgery, and it can develop after even even an uneventful cataract surgery. An important thing to note here is that the visual acuity initially remains normal, and then between four to twelve weeks, the disease presents. Often, the diagnosis is made clinically. And the visual equity of the patient will be around 612 to 618 with some distortion of vision might be there. On examination, there will be an isolated CME, not much of inflammation, not much of uh, gross inflammation or more, not much of uh, retinal hemorrhages or uh, any other abnormality. Uh, and geographically, it may be present in 20% of the cases, not necessary to do an FFA in such patients. OCT is merely enough to document the cystoid edema. But angiography do show a petaloid pattern in the late phase that is very characteristic. And in cases in which you have doubt that whether it is the DME which has worsened or is it the cystoid macular edema which is developed, you can look for the disc leak which is present in cases of CME. Now the pathophysiology here is multifactorial. It could be inflammatory in origin or mechanical. Commonly it is inflammatory because it can happen after an uneventful cataract surgery also. And in eventful cataract surgery, obviously, the mechanical vitreous traction on the retinal vessels causes the leakage. The risk factors you should remember because then the preventive therapy can be done. Pre-existing ocular inflammation, diabetic retinopathy, if there is vitreous loss during surgery, retain lens fragments and CME in the fellow eye. So you can put these patients on um, topical neuros, uh, NSAIDs and uh, topical steroids for a longer duration, perhaps for six weeks. Uh, you can continue them after the cataract surgery and perform a, a good cataract surgery that is important. 
Now, management in such cases, uh, the there is often spontaneous resolution in 80 80% 80 of the cases. You do not treat all patients. If you have angiographic CME, don't treat until unless it is clinical. Now, you should rule out active inflammation in the eye, cells in the anterior chamber or in the vitreous cavity, prostaglandin and log use if it, the patient has already been using and ensure a good systemic control that is diabetes and blood pressure control. And if it, there is uremia, then control of that. Now, a stepwise approach is usually taken. You can start the patient on topical NSAIDs, continue to follow them for one to three months. And if they are not responding on that, then you can switch to peribulbar steroids or intravitreal steroids such as Dex implant. In recalcitrant cases, obviously re refer the patient to a retinal colleague and uh, other options that are uh, there available there for uh, recalcitrant cases could be a topical diflupredinate uh, eye drops or uh, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, topical as well as oral. anti agents even have been tried in vitrectomy in uh, CVA cases. Now, last supracoroidal hemorrhage, uh, I'm just touching it here because if it happens during the intraoperative period or if you note it to happen in the early postoperative period, do send them immediately for the assessment because if there is kissing choroidal, if there is vitreous hemorrhage or retinal detachment, those cases need an early intervention. Else, they can be followed out sequentially for clot liquefaction on ultrasonography and drainage can be performed later. But all cases should be referred on day one to the retina surgeon for assessment. To conclude, ret cataract surgery nowadays has become very safe, but yet complications can occur, which could be grievous. And so cataract surgeon should be fully aware of them so that an appropriate treatment could be made in time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Devesh. Uh, very comprehensively covered all the situations that are possible here. Uh, if I can take in the panel now, uh, Dr. Manoj, if we, I can ask you, uh, when such a complication such as a posterior capsular uh, tear and uh, nucleus drop occurs, what would be your recommendation on the choice of IOL here? Uh, would you recommend putting in a single piece IOL in the sulcus or would you always recommend switching to a three piece IOL to the general ophthalmologist? <laughs> Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Kumar, for a uh, wonderful uh, presentation and uh, very lucidly cover all the topics. Uh, definitely, whenever uh, there is a choice of intraocular lens to be implanted in sulcus, it has to be a three-piece eye well. <clears throat> but uh, of late, uh, newer techniques have been discovered and we have also tried a couple of them in which uh, <clears throat> there is a reverse optic capture. Uh, so... You can even put a single piece lens, but uh, try to cap uh, capture the optic uh, into the uh, ACC, which is available anterior capsulectomy, or even the posterior capsulectomy if the tear has not enlarged much. So these are the different techniques, but <clears throat> the choice of an intraocular lens, <clears throat> I'm sorry, the, this is definitely three piece. Great. And uh, Dr. Rama Kumar, sir, as far as the timing of surgery goes post uh, nucleus drop, uh, same day surgery, uh, uh, Dr. Devesh obviously mentioned that initial one to two days may not be right. You do it either right away or maybe after a couple of days. So is that something you follow or something different that you would like to recommend? Yeah, usually in, in, our, in our setup, uh, some of the times we may have to shift the tables or the microscopes because the surgical system may not be available right at the place where the patient is being operated also. So if if possible, definitely on the same day with the same uh, like continuity as continuity of the same uh, surgery. If it is not possible, then I would always uh, prefer to wait for at least uh, three to four days before taking up and uh, manage the inflammation and the intraocular pressure in between. Uh, because uh, we need a, a clear field uh, for us to do the best possible job. So I don't want to compromise on that particular part regarding the visualization in these cases. So definitely I would wait if it is not possible uh, in the same sitting. Right. Thank you, sir. And Mahesh, sir, if I could ask you for Irwin gas syndrome or pseudophagic CME, uh, what is your approach to management of these cases? How long do you give each of these stepwise therapies or how early do you consider vitrectomy in these cases? Vitrectomy is usually the last option unless there is a vitreum attraction which is associated with it, which is noticed on uh, OCT. Otherwise, like it's a stepwise approach is what I usually do. Usually about like four to six weeks of uh, treatment is what I would suggest. 
So usually topical uh, dorsalamide as well as uh, NSAID is what I start off with about a month if it and with the OCT, it's, it's easier to follow up if in case the treatment is showing a response. If the cystoid edema is going down on OCT, then you know that it's getting better. And at the end of about a four to six weeks, if it's working, continue with the same treatment. If it is not, then switch to steroids, topical steroids, so, so like periocular steroids, intravital steroids. And uh, vitrectomy would probably be the last option. But then like... Uh, by which time the uh, visual outcomes may not also be great. But if there is traction, then probably you would want to intervene earlier uh, with the vitreous surgery, particularly uh, not only the vitreous macro traction, if the vitreous is incarcerated in the wound or if it is stuck to the iris and it's there in the anterior chamber, because this is going to not going to get better just with the pharm pharmacological treatment. So that vitreous would have to be removed. Otherwise, this patient is not going to get better. In that situation, an earlier vitreous would be preferred. We have Dr. Tinku here. Uh, do you think, ma'am, anti vegf have a role in this situation? Yes, anti vegfs do work, though the rationale for giving steroids is that since there is, you know, more prostaglandins in these cases. But, uh, you know, uh, dex implants are expensive and um, uh, uh, anti vegfs do also work in these cases. I've given anti vegfs to quite a few patients and they do work. So anti vegfs do also have a role. Except when the edema is, you know, uh, where you have very large cystoid spaces, it's a chronic edema, then uh, ozodex would be the first line. Otherwise, anti vegfs also would work. Especially in those cases which have uh, a tendency for glaucoma or uh, uh, steroid yeah. responders, better yeah. we consider. And then in those cases, I found that to be pretty helpful. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. Can I just uh, make a point, Simha? Yes, sir, please. Uh, so coming to the second question, uh, what you asked is uh, the timing of the, the lens implantation. So sometimes what we I do is wait for some time if the eye is silent, there's no corneal edema, then there is no vitritis, there is no increase in pressure. Usually waiting for around 8 to 10 days or 12 days. The rationale behind is for the capsular phimosis to happen. So if it's a large PCR where you cannot implant the IOL on the same setting, then it's better to wait for some time. Although the close observer uh, observation is very important in these kind of patients is because many of these cases, the, the welfare and phaco surgeons, they have only the cortical dropping, not usually the nucleus drop. So in these cases, we can always observe because that will not incite that much of vitritis or that much of inflammation or reaction. Uh, the reaction mainly comes is when we have the cut pieces of these nuclear fragments taking in over. So if the inflammation is very much under control, then I would like to wait for a few days until the capsular phimos happens so that the sulcus IOL becomes a good choice for it. In the cases where it is not improving, the coronal edema is uh, worsening or vitritis is increasing. So that means that if the main, the core is the, the what is the, uh, the inside the vitreous, so it has to be removed. So just a uh, thought of sharing this. Thank very, you. very rightly said, sir. And if I could just ask, so in cases in which there is a lot of inflammation and the uh, primary surgeon hasn't implanted IOL, would you consider a secondary IOL at the same setting or would you like to defer it for a uh, later period? So if it is if it is possible uh, to implant it in the sulcus, the sulcus is good enough to hold it. If, if, there if is, that is not possible, sir, the sulcus support is not adequate. So then if it is possible, the view, view is good, then go ahead. Anyhow, we are doing a vitrectomy, then implant the secondary IOL in the same place. If it is not permitting, then wait for some time until the eye becomes silent. Then we can always take a secondary approach, like uh, whether you can put a steel tuck IOL, a suture, or uh, you can even put it, uh, uh, the externalize it, Yamane, whatever techniques now available uh, now in the literature, you can just do it. Right. Thank you so much, sir. So coming to our uh, next talk, uh, it will be on uh, end of thermitis by Dr. Barwick. As already discussed, uh, see, cataract is the most commonly performed surgery and coming to the cataract surgeon's perspective, endophthalmitis is something which they dread. So over to Bhavit, sir, and who will be telling about uh, how, when, what to be done. So first of all, thank you so much to AIOS for this uh, forum and this opportunity as well. Am I audible? And uh, are my slides visible? Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay.
Great. Yes. So uh, we'll begin uh, with this for the comprehensive ophthalmologist in terms of end of the mitis uh, and the anterior segment surgeons. How to identify if, and if at all you are faced with a situation where you have a patient who has a likely end of the mitis, how to mitigate the damage and the management at your own level or before referral, what you can do. Uh, just before I begin, end of the mitis can be broadly classified as exogenous and endogenous. And exogenous has a four main varieties that is post operative, traumatic, microbial keratitis associated, and blip associated. We are going to concentrate today on the post operative end of the mitis, which again can be acute, that is of less than six weeks duration, or chronic, which is more than six weeks duration. So let's have a look at this case scenario. This is about a 43 year old female post cataract surgery, right? And that was three weeks prior. The vision, presenting vision is CF1 meter. So do you think this is end of the mitis? Looking at the picture here. Okay, maybe you want a B scan since you are not able to see the funders. B scan has few uh, membranous echoes or few dot like echoes which are seen noted here. Now, can you say this is end of the mitis? Okay, let us see what happens to this patient. This patient was treated with topical steroid and cyclopegics and improved to 2040 at this point in time. This is the fundus picture. So the question here is that, how does one know that, okay, this patient presenting to me, does this patient have acute post-operative endophthalmitis or not? So what are the clinical signs that points towards endophthalmitis? Look at this picture here, right? It's a straightforward diagnosis. This is what we feel. Okay, this is endophthalmitis, isn't it? So looking at this picture, let us understand a few of the signs that will help us uh, differentiate from conditions which mimic end of the mitis and uh, we can come to a much more conclusive diagnosis at a very early stage. So patients will have may or may have late edema, a mucoporal and discharge, ciliary and conjunctal congestion uh, with chemosis. They can have a central epit effect, okay, uh, with irregular margins. There can be diffuse stromal edema. Uh, deep stromal, sometimes it can be a ring infiltrate, which may be infective or which may be immune and hypopion may be associated as well. Right? Great. So, few questions that we need to know for a case of acute post-operative endophthalmitis. First of all, is it a virulent or a non-virulent organism? What are the common organisms that cause acute post-operative endophthalmitis? What are the differential diagnosis? And what is the initial treatment of acute post-operative end of the mitis? So answering the first question, how do we clinically identify a highly virulent organism causing end of the mitis, right? So we have to understand that, okay, one has performed a cataract surgery. The onset of symptoms have started just within two or three days itself. And the initial vision when the patient comes to you is either perception of light or extremely low vision. There is no red glow which is seen and the fundus is not visible. There is an afferent pupillary defect. There might be a presence of corneal infiltrate as well. And the cat there are cataract wound abnormalities. Either the wound is leaking or there is an infiltrate present at the wound as well. So let us look at a few examples here to understand this scenario, whether it is a virulent or a non-virulent organism. So left eye, this patient presented with diminution of vision of one week post cataract surgery, 2400 vision, disc and retina hazily seen. Let us ask the six valid points or six important questions. So what the, was this onset within two days of surgery? Answer is no. Initial vision, perception of light? No. Is there any loss of red reflex? No. The disc and retina is seen hazily. Afferent pupil defect? No. Is there any corneal infiltrate? No. And the, the cataract wound appears intact. So this patient most likely is caused by a low virulent organism and there is non-fulminant inflammation. At the same time, this is a kind of picture that one may encounter. Two days following cataract surgery, PL positive vision, corneal infiltrate present, right? So loss of red reflex present, presence of RAPD, and there are cataract wound abnormalities which are present as well. Such kind of infections are fulminant and caused by high virulent organism. So just an important point here in terms of understanding ring infiltrate of the cornea in endophthalmitis differentiating between an infective versus an immune ring infiltrate. An immune ring infiltrate will have a clear space between the infiltrate and the limbus. 
initially stroma will be involved and mostly it resolves with steroids whereas an infective one will require antibiotics and there is no clear space between the limbus and the infiltrate okay the point of hypopion that we noticed so presence of a hypopion hypopion can be present in both a low virulent inflammation organism as well as a high virulent organism as well okay it can be sterile uh, vitreous kind of picture as well where a hypopion might be present so just the presence of hypopion does not mean a patient has endophthalmitis okay is a very important point we'll come to some cases on that as well so is it it is important to understand why a highly virulent organism is causing endophthalmitis and why it is important to initiate the treatment diagnose and initiate the treatment as early as possible because the the it's a prolonged course of treatment and possibly poor visual outcomes will be uh, normally poor visual outcomes will be present if not identified and treated early aggressive treatment is required maybe with vitrectomy if the view permits right and so on coming to the next question here what is the clinical spectrum of organisms most commonly encountered especially in india right so we have the staphylococcus epidermidis and the aureus coagulus negative staphylococcus streptococcus species and the gram negative bacteria when you look at intravictal antibiotics in acute post operative endophthalmitis the question is is it important to give empirical antibiotic in all cases yes it is important to give an uh, empirical antibiotics in all the cases and how do we decide which intravital antibiotic to inject right so there are several studies which are performed by different groups and most of the cases for a gram positive organism vancomycin even at in today's uh, day and age is more than 95% sensitivity is known to vancomycin whereas for gram negative coverage it depends on the geography location right uh, there might be presence of resistance to ceftazidime or even imipenem in certain cases so based on the geographical location and the antibiotic sensitivity pattern in your location you may consider either a ceftazidime imipenem or a colistin okay so the next question here is how do you decide when to repeat intravital antibiotics very simple you may have to repeat every 40 to 72 hours until you see the disc and the first order vessels okay or you may have to take a for vitrectomy as well and there are minimum equals which persistent b scan in case of poor uh, posterior segment visibility in terms of when you talk about acute uh, post operative endophthalmitis majority of them are caused by bacteria however sometimes fungal etiology may also be seen so you have to consider antifungals in an acute post operative endophthalmitis when your empirical treatment is not working the patient is worsening on treatment of antibacterial agents right or a vitreous biopsy shows a culture which is positive for a fungal growth coming to the differential diagnosis of acute post operative endophthalmitis it can be increased post of inflammation flare up of uncontrolled uveitis traumatic cataract surgery or endogenous endophthalmitis just two cases here a patient with pdr uneventful cataract surgery had hypopion at presentation but if you see here there is no lead edema no congestion okay good glow disc and retina seen uh, hazily right so this patient here was admitted and given a trial of steroids before considering a diagnosis of endophthalmitis and the patient was reevaluated sooner in 12 hours or by the in the morning the patient comes reevaluated in the evening and the patient improves right same way here present patient presents with uh, hypopion at one week post surgery but the disc is uh, the retina is uh, seen properly the, there is no vitreitis do not jump to a diagnosis of endophthalmitis right just with topical steroids and proper close follow up this patient this patient is also improved so the initial treatment is counseling of the patient extremely important to make them understand that okay uh, what are the expectations of the patient post endophthalmitis not everyone is going to gain vision uh, sometimes the uh, prognosis is not predictable as well uh, the organism may be multi drug resistant and so on so multiple interventions might be required primary surgery is not for visual recovery right and there's always a risk of thysis bulbi and symptomatic of them that has to be explained so yes a vitreous biopsy versus an ectap and a corneal scraping if there is microbial keratitis 
Over vitrectomy is definitely much to reduce the load of the inflam of the of the infection when a proper view permits. Intraocular antibiotics are a must along with steroids as per your own institute policy. Topical antibiotics, if there is spinal involvement, oral antibiotics, if you think uh, there is panophthalmitis or there are virulent organisms which are present. And uh, for bacterial endophthalmitis, uh, topical steroids are trooping to be added. Oral steroids, if at all, patient is not diabetic and you are confident that the patient can sustain the oral steroids. So uh, I acknowledge uh, Dr. Avinash, Dr. Shreyansh, Dr. Mega for their inputs in this presentation. And uh, I hope to the general ophthalmologist, uh, this was a useful talk. Thank you so much. Very nice presentation, sir. So coming to the discussion, uh, to Kim, sir, uh, Bhavik, sir, has already summarized all details very concisely. But as we say, prevention is better than cure. Sir, would you add few tips what a general surgeon should take care to avoid such scenarios? And especially in high volume settings, a role of intracameral antibiotics, sir? Uh, this is role of intracameral antibiotic, I think, has been a question many. Uh, we routinely do in all our cases because, you know, we have a very high volume and the paper that was published by Dr. Haripriya had clearly shown the difference it makes in most of the patients. Uh, so we continue to use that. But for any, uh, I mean, for the general ophthalmologists or the cataract surgeons, one important thing is to follow protocol, preoperative protocol and a complete asepsis. But once you see these patients, I think uh, Bavik has clearly shown the importance of the urgency of when you have to act on these patients. So, uh, the, I mean, the, the, the most important point is having the height of suspicion when you're seeing these patients, especially when there's a hypopion. You follow these patients more aggressively than just letting them and following them after a week or 10 days later. So... That's all I, I I mean I would add here at this point. Thank you, sir, uh, sir uh, Dr. Anand, sir. Uh, sir, what is your take on uh, the dilemma between uh, EVS study and CEV? Which study would you prefer to follow, and uh, any tips and buts which you want to highlight? So I think uh, I mean like we have to you know endothelial man uh, endothelial management is a moving board. And you have to realize that uh, VS was at that point of time uh, valid. And now we have finer instrumentation, better instrumentation, better ways of uh, dealing with endophthalmitis. And uh, I agree with uh, Bhavik, I mean, the uh, kind of uh, algorithm that he pointed out. And uh, we also have better and stronger antibiotics. So it's important to go with them. And also, I personally prefer going in a little earlier because uh, I feel, you know, at the end of the day, if you look at it very, uh, in a very straightforward manner, it's a possible bank. So going in and debulking that helps. Uh, aids faster recovery. So I think uh, going in earlier makes a uh, difference to me. And I agree with his, uh, I mean, uh, with, those, with that particular slide where he put up those antibiotics uh, regimens for the gram negative and that is we also follow that uh, kind of a schedule. So I think going in harder uh, is important. And uh, right in this day and age, with uh, my even micro gauge detection, even 27 gauge, uh, we have been able to even get, you know, we've seen back up to 6, 9. So, so I think uh, that is important. Thank you, sir. Uh, coming to Chaitra, ma'am, uh, ma uh, role of PCR in end of management, uh, would you suggest any role of TAP with the PCR analysis, polymerase chain reaction? Let's see. Uh, ma'am, you do. I don't think ma'am is good. Uh, ma'am is good. Uh, Manisha has got something to say. So Manisha, ma'am, please. I just had one comment to make that, you know, when we are trying to guess whether we are dealing with endophthalmitis or not, I think it's always a, uh, it's important that we have a chat with the operating surgeon who's done the cataract surgery or any, or the surgery following which we are suspecting endo because it's important to know whether it has been an uneventful surgery or there has been some kind of a complication during the surgery because then you can correlate 
with the kind of inflammation that you are getting. If there it has been a totally uneventful, but still you are getting a very aggressive inflammation on the first post-op day, probably you need to err more on the side of an endophthalmitis. So I just wanted to highlight that, that rather than having a guess, it's important that you go through the OT notes or have a chat with the operating surgeon. Definitely. Um, yeah, Dr. Mahesh, please go ahead, sir. Yeah, we have a tendency as operating surgeons to believe that it's probably not endophthalmitis and most likely tend to think it could be just a task. So it's better to err on the side of uh, uh, caution and think of it as an endophthalmitis and think of doing a, probably an AC tap and then giving an intravitreal injection before we refer to the retinal surgeon. So at least that primary treatment is definitely possible with uh, every ophthalmologist. And better to err on the side of thinking that it's endophthalmitis rather than tending to think that it could be TAS, it could be TAS, and then delaying it so that like uh, the outcomes may not be optimal. Thank you, sir. Dr. Tinko, please. Yeah, uh, Dr. Shiram, I'll take that question you just asked about PCR. So I have not really found PCR to be of great value because the false positivity rate with the PCR test is extremely high. You know, it magnifies even the small contaminants that you may have. And this has been a perpetual problem. We never, ever get a very, you know, a, a very pointed result with the PCR. So, uh, but uh, the Zyton has been very helpful, which is a patented technology, the lab in Zyton for the benefit of every the audience. This gives us the result within 24 hours and you need to send a very small sample. Uh, just 0 0.05 ml of sample. And most of the times, I mean, I would say 99% of the times, the organism that they give is always very, or, you know, the right organism. So Zyton is something that I have been relying on in um, my end of the night cases. And PCR really hasn't been. And as far as AC tap is concerned, I think AC tap is extremely important before you load the patients with antibiotics because it can be a very important sample for microbiology. So I think uh, that is something which can be done by everybody <clears throat> in the OPD itself. And that's an important sample. Thank you. Uh, yes. Any more comments? Yeah, Dr. Freedom. Uh, regarding the, uh, like, uh, we, we had a uh, good uh, mention in the presentation that uh, one one should be aware about not all hypopoyan is uh, endophthalmitis. Especially, I would like to stress upon the point that if someone is seeing a hypopoyan on day one, and if other signs of endophthalmitis are not there, they need not be panicky. Definitely, we uh, we have to keep the patient with us and uh, follow uh, at least uh, six hourly or 12 hourly basis. But at the same time, uh, all those uh, endoffs that happen on day one, they are by highly virulent organisms and uh, panoff is the, the ultimate result and the eye melts in no time. So, uh, so other signs of uh, end of are not there and only hypopoeia someone is seeing, I think uh, one need not be panicky. Just uh, follow the patient uh, for the next couple of days and uh, I think all those cases do well. So one should be aware about this uh, particular point. That's what I want to stress upon. I think we had just a, uh, the last a couple of questions in the chat box that were asked on the online platform. So I think Apurva was here with us. Apurva, are you there? Yes, I'm here. So there's a question that can AOVD in early stages show hyperautofluorescence? So adult onset fovea macular dystrophy, do you think uh, uh, in early stages it shows hyperautofluorescence? Basically, they want to pick it up early. How? What would be the best in imaging modality to go about it? Uh, for uh, adult onset fovea macular dystrophy, right? Yeah, vitelliform dystrophy. Yeah. yeah. So there are two reasons for hyperautofluorescence in AOFVD. One is the vitelliform deposits themselves, and the second reason in the progression is that in the late stages, the outer retinal thinning is there, which kind of unmasks the underlying RP. So that is also a reason for hyper -AF. So we should always correlate with the OCT. Definitely early stages will have some SRF, some uh, outer retinal on the outer border of the retina, there will be some deposits and also there will be deposits over the RPE. So I would expect hyper -AF in the early stages. 
I would also expect, like I said, hyper AF in the late stages because of a different reason. So uh, I would correlate with the structural OCT and make the diagnosis of whether it's early or late. I would do an AF for whenever I'm suspecting. Right. Any other questions, any other comments from the panel? Or else we can hand it over to Dr. Srinivas for the concluding comment. Okay. Uh, I think we come to the end of it. And I must say that uh, this is one of the very few webinars that we are concluding on time. Uh, just, uh, I think, uh, eight or nine minutes past nine. And uh, I'm really thankful to the VRSI uh, for organizing and tying it up with uh, ARC. Special thanks to Dr. Kim sir, Dr. Mahesh sir, Dr. Manisha madam and the entire VC of VRSI and uh, all the expert panels and uh, the young Turks and excellent moderation by Dr. Simmer and uh, Dr. Sriram. Thank you very much and I, I request everybody to please switch on their video so that we can have a, a quick photograph and I, I, I also thank uh, Sunil from Zadio Tech who has been there right from the beginning and I've seen him from most of the webinars because he has to keep the time for the speakers but that shows how the retinal surgeons are and they don't need the timer and uh, their talk itself is like a, a time thing so uh, thank you very much everyone yes Mahesh sir uh, special thanks to Sriram Sriram has put up a great job of putting up the whole program and uh, special uh, sort of thanks to Sriram yeah, from my yes. side Thank you, sir. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Dr. Sridhar. Thank you very thank, much. Thank you, thank you, everyone, for uh, accepting my request and uh, being part of the webinar. Sir. Thank you. Sridhar did a great job, constantly reminding everyone. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, sir.